All right, so today, uh, March 4th, 2021. And so this is uh, uh, Jesus in the second worldwide course to restore Canaan. Uh, it's a, yes, part one. And the scripture uh, I, will be uh, uh, these are three uh, temptations that Jesus received uh, in the wilderness. Uh, this is the first one in the Matthew 4, 1 to 4. Uh, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted, 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter, uh, tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones in, uh, become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Amen. Uh, so uh, ACLC is founded uh, in 2000 in Korea uh, with the 120 clergy gathered to affirm the vision and given by God to Reverend uh, Mrs. Moon, uh, our father, mother Moon, to unify the body of Christ. So this is uh, May 22, uh, the picture of the old clergy to gather and shout it out. And the purpose is to, of ACLC is to unify the body of Christ. ACLC is a coalition of clergy working to strengthen marriages, rebuild families, restore our communities, and renew the nation and the world. And this is a scripture regarding the unity and diversity in the one body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.10. And the Father Moon said, you can unite Christianity if you set aside the elements that cause disunity and preserve the core around which all Christians can unite. So our study is uh, invite the clergy to study and discuss the vision of founder of ACLC and WCLC so that Christian leadership can find a commonality across the uh, believers in uniting the body of Christ and restore God's kingdom on the earth. And so uh, that we are uh, at in the uh, principle of restoration uh, section three, uh, providence of restoration under the leadership of Jesus. And so uh, we are at the second worldwide course so last uh, 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 study, we, uh, we learned the uh, first course uh, re restoring the uh, Canaan, uh, which was the center on the uh, John, John the Baptist. But as we uh, study the scripture, the uh, John uh, in the beginning, the, he testified about uh, uh, Jesus as uh, the Son of God, and but later on he was imprisoned, and he sent the disciples to Jesus and asking the whether uh, he the one uh, we, uh, or uh, we should wait for the other. Shall we uh, wait for the other? So the uh, John uh, John the Baptist uh, could not. Uh, fulfill the, his uh, mission as the uh, as a forerunner uh, for Jesus, uh, the who, those who the the one that who uh, make the way uh, you know clear for Jesus um, his Messiah's uh, work, but uh, so as a result, the John uh, had an untimely uh, death uh, in the prison. Uh, by the, you know, uh, uh, King Herod. So uh, this is a, a, a second worldwide cause, but this time is not 
center on John, but center on Jesus. Uh, we can see the uh, next slide. Uh, after a short video, uh, then the, we can go to the uh, more in-depth, you know, review of the scripture and also the our, our discussion and forum. So, because of that failure, the second worldwide course to restore Canaan had to begin, and it has to begin with the foundation of faith. So that foundation of faith is going to need a central person. So the foundation of faith, which John laid for the first course, was invaded by Satan. Jesus now had to take on John's mission and restore through indemnity the foundation of faith for the second worldwide course to restore Canaan. When Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, it was to separate Satan for the very purpose of restoring the foundation of faith. So if you look in Scripture, you'll see that right after John the Baptist and Jesus meet in the baptism, it's right after that when John doesn't become his follower, does not become his disciple, that's the point where Jesus goes into the wilderness to fast for 40 days. However, for this, Jesus lowered himself from the Lord of glory to assume the position of John the Baptist and walk a path of suffering. Jesus enjoined Peter not to reveal that he was the Messiah, because although he was the Messiah, he had assumed John's role to begin this phase of the providence. So if you look at Matthew 16, 20, then he, Jesus, sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So what is taking place here? The first worldwide course was successfully established by John the Baptist. But when John the Baptist did not offer that and connect with Jesus, it was lost. Hmm. Therefore, what did Jesus have to do? He leaves his position as Messiah, and he takes this role to fulfill the foundation of faith. Who else does he have to call on? Who else can he go to and ask, you know, can you please be the one to testify to me, to stand up to everyone and show everyone that I'm the Messiah? There's no one who can do that. So he himself takes on this role uh, to stand as a central person for the foundation of faith. And he does that by what? By making a condition of indemnity, by going to the wilderness to fast for 40 days. Then on that foundation, if it's successful, if he's successful, he will then seek to find Jewish people to come and unite with him, just as they united with John the Baptist, that they can humble themselves and receive him and work with him together. If that's successful, then Jesus will be able to stand as Messiah. So once he has this foundation, he stands with God, he has a people who are united with him, then Jesus would be able to say to those people, you know, by the way, I happen to be the Messiah that you were waiting for. And those people then would have been able to completely receive him and uplift him as a Messiah. Jesus' three temptations in the wilderness. It is written that after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, Satan tested Jesus three times. First, he showed Jesus stones and tempted him to turn them into loaves of bread. Next, he took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and challenged him to throw himself down. Finally, Satan took Jesus to a very high mountain and offered to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would fall down and worship him. What was Satan's purpose in giving Jesus the three temptations? Jesus came into the world to accomplish the purpose of creation by restoring the three great blessings. Therefore, Satan tempted Jesus three times in an attempt to prevent him from restoring the three blessings. Jesus' answer to the first temptation was, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4 by this victory over this temptation, Jesus fulfilled the condition to restore the individual perfection and thereby establish the restoration of God's first blessing. Next, Satan brought Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give His angels charge over you. Matthew 4 6. Jesus referred to Himself as the temple in John 2 19. John 2.19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, referring to himself, and in three days I will raise it up. 
So Jesus is in the position of the temple. Even Satan had to acknowledge his position. Thus, he put Jesus on the top of the temple. When Satan dared Jesus to throw himself down, it meant that he wanted to usurp Jesus' position by enticing Jesus to fall from that position to the lowly state of a fallen person. By overcoming the second temptation, Jesus, the main temple, the bridegroom and the true parent, established the basis upon which to restore God's second blessing. Finally, Satan took Jesus to a very high mountain. All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me, Matthew 4, 9. As a perfected Adam, Jesus was the Lord of creation. As it is written, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15, 27. Satan led Jesus to the top of the mountain in recognition of Jesus' position as Lord of creation. Satan then tempted Jesus, hoping that Jesus, the second Adam, might also submit to him as Adam had submitted in the beginning. By prevailing in the third temptation, Jesus set up the condition to restore dominion over the natural world, God's third blessing. So let's take a brief look. Jesus' three temptations in the wilderness. These three, three temptations were change the stone to bread, throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple, and to bow down to Satan and receive all the kingdoms of the earth. The last three blessings were what? The first blessing was individual perfection. The second blessing was a family perfection. And the third blessing was to have dominion over all things. This is what was lost in the fall of Adam and Eve. So Jesus restores these three great blessings. So he restores the word of God, the position of the true, the word in flesh, the true son of God, the perfected you know, temple on this earth. He does that by what? He's tempted to change the stones to bread. So when you think of a stone, where does that, if you think back to the, this whole process of restoration, the stone takes us back to Moses' time. Remember, Jesus said, I am the rock. And it's when Moses struck the rock twice with bitter anger that he lost his position, and God uh, told him he would not be able to enter Canaan. That was a condition of striking Christ. So here, Satan is coming and saying, again, based upon the rock, the stone, he's saying, you know, defile the stone like Moses did, and, you know, uh, turn it to bread for your own self-satisfaction that you can end your hunger. So Jesus is very clear, and he understands exactly what this temptation means. And he puts himself above that and says, no, uh, we will live not by, by, by bread, but by the word of God. And he, of course, is the word of God. So he's putting himself in this position of perfected Adam. And then in the second temptation, he maintains his position. He doesn't throw himself off the temple. And this is not just one temple. There are synagogues throughout, uh, uh, throughout the country of Judea. So by maintaining his position, it's the whole family of the faith, of the chosen people. It's that family which he is also saving. So in this way, the second blessing, which was about the family, is restored. And finally, when he's tempted to bow down in order that he can become Lord of all this world, he tells his Satan, no, that he is, as a son of God, he is the true Lord of this world. And that comes from his relationship with God as God's true son. So Jesus goes through these three temptations. He overcomes every one and he emerges victorious. So I think this is a very, you know, a very hopeful moment for God in God's heart. And God says, hey, we can do this. Now we have this uh, clear position established, victory over Satan. I have my son standing in the position of my son on this earth. Satan has tried to attack him, but has failed. So now what is needed? If the foundation of substance can be fulfilled, Jesus will be able to establish the needed foundation for the Messiah. So we're going to stop here. We'll conclude here. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go back, go back to the my screen. Uh, I'm gonna read some scripture. Am I again muted? I'm not muted.
So first temptation, uh, we read in the beginning. Then the second temptation, the Matthew, Matthew 4 to 5. Matthew 4, 5 to 7. <clears throat> then the devil uh, took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels a charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. Lest you dash your foot against the stone, and Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then the third temptation, Matthew 4, 8 to 10. Again, the devil took him up on the exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Matthew 4, 8 to 10. So now that uh, there, uh, there is a, a speech given by Actually, this is a sermon given by the uh, Reverend Moon uh, back in 1959. The title is The Sorrowful Heart of Jesus as He Went to the Mountain. So this is almost like uh, his uh, reflection, uh, his uh, deep uh, kind of insight uh, about the heart of Jesus uh, when he went through the uh, temptation and uh, came out you know, victorious uh, from the temptation. Uh, I wanna ask Julia to uh, read this um, few, few okay. slides. Heart of Jesus. Jesus defeated Satan by overcoming three temptations in the wilderness, the last of them on a mountaintop. Yet we should realize that when Jesus journeyed to the wilderness after, be, after being rejected by the chosen one, John the Baptist, a situation that made likely his rejection by the Jewish nation as well, he carried a heart of sorrow, the like of which no one on earth had ever experienced. The determination and sense of mission. Jesus was filled with the determination and sense of mission to pay the debts of history. What did he think about during his 40 days of fasting? He felt an acute sense of responsibility to restore through indemnity by himself the rueful course of his forebearers. As he walked through the wilderness, Jesus might have thought about how all mankind the descendants of Adam and Eve, ever since their expulsion from the Garden of Eden, have been roaming about a wilderness of sorrows in search of the garden. Reflected on Abraham. What Jesus did think about as Satan led him to the top of the mountain. Jesus reflected on Abraham, who had journeyed to a mountain after he was co commanded to sacrifice Isaac. He thought of Abraham's heartbreak as he led his son up Mount Moriah. For whom did Abraham have to offer his only son Isaac as a sacrifice? Jesus must have reflected upon this fact that it was for Heavenly Father and ultimately for the Messiah, for him. Recalled Moses. Jesus then recalled Moses. He imagined the scene in which God appeared to the sorrow-stricken Moses in the burning bush by the foot of Mount Horeb and formed an unchanging bond with him. 
Moses fasted and prayed for 40 days, and he came down with God's word. For whom did Moses pray and fast for 40 days? Jesus reflected that it was only for the sake of Heavenly Father and only for the sake of establishing a restored nation through the cho chosen people and of paving the road for the Messiah. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Now when John heard that John had been Jesus. Hmm? Jesus. When Jesus. No, oh, sorry. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he depart, departed to Galilee. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4 11, 12, and 17. Accepting what Jesus taught. When you say you believe in Jesus, do you only believe in those things that make you feel good? Do you, re do you reject those things about Jesus that make you feel painful? We should accept what Jesus taught and do those things that Jesus himself would want us to do. We should not take part in the things that Jesus would not like. What are those things which Jesus would not like? They are simply Satan and sin. For what should we repent? We should separate ourselves from Satan and sin and, and believe in Jesus from that position rather than from a position in which sin, Satan, and Jesus are all mixed together in our lives. This is why Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For what should we repent? We should repent for the fact that we have been living together with Satan and sin throughout our lives. Mission of Jesus. Once we have repented and separated ourselves from Satan, Jesus urges us to believe in God and serve God. Jesus wanted to rule over the world from which Satan and sin were eradicated not a world in which Satan was mixed together with everything and in which people had just a vague belief in Jesus. Jesus' mission was to separate individuals completely from Satan and sin and separate families and countries from Satan and sin. Sins that dwell in me, even the most faithful believer in Jesus or the most righteous church on earth cannot proclaim proudly that they are absolutely separated from Satan and sin and that they are following Jesus exactly as he would have them do. No one can say they are living in a perfect love in an ideal world with no suffering and tears. This means that Satan exists as much within churches as he exists everywhere else. Furthermore, there is almost as much sin there as in the rest of the world. If this is true, and if that what church people love and hate is no different from what the rest of the world loves and hates, then there is very little difference between the world and the church. Which would Satan find more pleasure in? the church or the world. Deliver me from this body of death. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another, another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members oh wretched man that i am who will deliver me from this body of death i thank god through jesus christ our lord romans 7 21 to 25 thank you so 
uh, when we discuss, I, I want to bring the, this two uh, point uh, to focus on. One is uh, how does it make you feel when you think of Jesus as he emerged victoriously with hope and determination from 40 days fasting and the three temptations? So we know that the situation that uh, Jesus faced was a really uh, a difficult one, uh, unprecedented, uh, nobody experiences that type of uh, uh, difficulty and suffering and sorrow. The, uh, especially the, when John the, John the Baptist, who was uh, chosen by God, as a representative of the entire uh, history uh, of the 4,000 years to prepare uh, the coming of the Messiah, that John the Baptist was beheaded and uh, no longer there. And even the, he created the, so much uh, confusions among the Jewish people because John did not testify yeah, he is the Elijah, even though Jesus said that uh, if you accept, John is the Elijah you are waiting for. So this is a, a situation Jesus was in, but he uh, followed the uh, heaven's uh, guidance, just as uh, Abraham did and Moses did. And uh, he, he went to the wilderness for 40 days and the fasting and the uh, prayer. And uh, finally, uh, he, met, he faced the uh, three temptations, uh, but he emerged victoriously. How, how, how do you, uh, in your mind, you know, if you imagine the situation and uh, putting yourself in the footstep of our Lord Jesus Christ, it may be uh, you feel that I'm not worthy to be, but if you 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 want to really bring the uh, yourself uh, to to be a di disciple or somehow the the one that who completely follow him, we must understand we must understand the heart of Jesus when he emerged victoriously, and what kind of hope he had and what kind of determination he had, so that we can also become one with him and follow him. So that is a question. <laughs> it's a big question, but uh, I hope uh, uh, you can come to, uh, come up, come up, you know, share that uh, you can share uh, your, your thought and your, your heart. And the second one is the first teaching of Jesus after 40 days of fasting and the three temptations was repent. So this is the first uh, teaching, repent. And uh, then the, uh, uh, for the kingdom, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of, of God is at hand. So first, in order for us to enter the kingdom of heaven or even live in the kingdom of heaven, first step is the repentance, repent. So we, we have to really come to understanding that what is the repentance what Jesus is urging us to do? Uh, for what should we repent, and how we should uh, how should we repent? So uh, this is a question, and uh, let me. Uh, oh, Reverend Gabriel, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, Okay, uh, how about uh, Reverend, uh, start with Reverend Reginald. Uh, would you like to share with us? I think uh, uh, this is uh, one of the area that we all want to come to the very, you know, good understanding. And not, not just the surface, you know, the, just on, only the concept, but also that we want to feel the uh, depths of the heart of God and the heart of Jesus. So if uh, uh, Reverend Reginald, are you there? Pastor Reginald. Pastor Reginald. 
Pastor Reginald. Oh, God to Sister Nancy. Okay, how about Nancy? Would you like to share with us? Pastor Nancy. Nancy? Pastor Nancy. Okay. Hello. All right. Yeah. I'm just so excited to know the victory of Jesus and to be able to understand more and more details about how really it was a victory and it is a victory now. And, um, and so many odds and so many difficulties that could have arisen that did arise and how just each thing, each point he was able to claim victory. And so I'm just so, so it's so amazing to me, his love and the, the reason for all this is because of the love of heavenly parents and God and for the love of Jesus, right? that he just loved the people, he loved the world that he could give his son. And I'm just so excited and so grateful this morning. <clears throat> yeah, and that's, I think, all I can say right now in my situation with taking care of grandchildren and driving to the next grandchildren. <laughs> but thank you so much. I'm so happy to be able to be listening today. Well, thank you. Nice, nice morning in Japan. God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for uh, attending in the... Maybe. Yeah, no, thank you for having this. Okay, so Reverend Reginald, this uh, may not be available. Mm, I didn't have to. Mm. He, he may come back. Okay, hi, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, how about the next uh, second question uh, about the repentance? What was the question? Okay, the, uh, the, the first... Uh, uh, first word that Jesus spoke, you know, after the temptation, and he yes. anyway, his, his first words he spoke about the, his, his ministry was the repent. Was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> the, and the, uh, Father Moon's you know account on the repentance is kind of revealing that this is a word that quite often that uh, for, forgotten. Uh, mm. believers because you know we always emphasize you know uh, thank you Jesus right yeah and God and kingdom of heaven at hand but all the good, great news great news good news but are we just uh, you know uh, focus on the good news oh, I see everything that what Jesus said you know right. this first commandment mm. Right. So that's the things. Uh, uh, mm. What we should repent and how we should gonna we should re how we should repent. So anyway, the, it, this is a re really kind of a, a very uh, personal, uh, but also the you know very important uh, issue. And so I don't know if you can answer that. <laughs> <while you're laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can try. Um, <laughs> Hmm. Uh, I find that um, for myself, sometimes um, it's very difficult to repent. I can say the same things over and over again. I can recognize that, that something was not right in my nature that caused this to happen, you know. But um, so sometimes it's difficult just if you're told to repent, you know. Like John the Baptist's mission was to bring repentance and to bring the people to be purified so they could receive the Christ, right? And then John the Baptist failed and, I mean, failed to be able to do that. So then Jesus immediately had to start saying that afterwards, right? So um, to be able to bring the people to know that they're loved, you know, bring me to know that I'm, if I know that I'm being loved, then I can repent, you know, and I can really feel God's, God's heart for me, 
and I can feel that he loves me and I can recognize how much he loves me through the sacrifice that he's gone through and through the love of Jesus, then I know that, um, then I start to cry because he loves me so much. And then I recognize the points within me that's causing causing um, him not to be able to relate with me completely because I have like sin or obstacles or fallen nature within me, which is forgiven. So it causes even more tears, you know? And so because of the love he has for me, then I can repent, you know? So I don't know if this is answering your question. <laughs> but it's a personal testimony. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a personal, personal testimony. Without, yeah, yeah. you know, personal account, you know, it doesn't yeah. mean Thank you very much. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Oh, Reverend uh, uh, Reginald, are you there? Oh, <laughs> his, uh, his electricity is uh, making a lot of noise. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Nancy. Um, That's original. Yeah, original. Reverend original is there, but uh, you know the uh, power that he has created so much noise. Uh, he, he was, he was probably talking, but uh, just uh, that doesn't become the sound. <laughs> that's the situation here right now. So that's great to me. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I will, I will give, I will give my account on this one. Uh, I'll okay, Julia. Just one point that I want to bring up. That, you know, sometimes we skip over a point and we don't see it, but. Uh, this time, one of the points that sort of sunk in for me was um, that Jesus fasted. The, it said that the, the, why did Jesus fast 40 days? You know, if he was the Messiah, he doesn't need to fast 40 days. Um, but the reason he fasted 40 days was because when John the Baptist was um, beheaded, Jesus had no, uh, like, uh, you know, John the Baptist. He didn't have anybody to go before him and make make straight the way of the Lord so he in order for him to kind of get that authority and and that he had to fast that 40 days it was kind of like taking the the foundation from John to himself and um, that's I think a point that we missed a lot because I was always curious why is and then then he said to his disciples don't tell them uh, that, like he asked the disciples, who do you say I am? And they say, you are the son of God, the living Christ. And he said, don't tell anybody that. So, you know, that explains why he said, don't tell anybody, because mm -hmm. he's still in the process of um, inheriting everything from John as, as, the, um, mm -hmm. as the John the Baptist figure. And then he became, he regained his position as Messiah. Yeah, it's a Matthew 16, 20, the Jesus taught disciple, uh, do not uh, tell anyone he is the Messiah. So, uh, the, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it wasn't that he wasn't the Messiah. He yeah. just, uh, the time wasn't right for him to proclaim it. Right. The uh, one, one, one thing that really struck me is that, uh, Jesus took the responsibility for the uh, whatever happened, you know, in uh, John John the Baptist or uh, people of Israel, Israel like uh, Jewish people, their mistake, their faithlessness. Jesus took full responsibility. That's just like a Moses, when the uh, Moses was in, in near the Mount Sinai, the People of Israel, Israelites, they complained and they started to disbelieve, disbelieve Moses. And uh, but the Moses uh, pleaded God, please give me one more chance. You know, even though they, you know, they he he did forty days fast and then he came back and then everybody was just completely lost their faith. 
But here Moses took responsibility one more time of the for the people, not for him. He did he didn't do fast fasting or whatever he is doing is not for him. Actually, for, for the people, for God, he took full responsibility. That was the same. I feel the same for of course Jesus took a full responsibility for the mistake and failure of the uh, Jewish people. And also the, at the end, of course, he, he took a full responsibility for our sins. Our sins are coming from our ancestor, uh, Adam and Eve, and also the, all the sins that the uh, Bible describes, you know, uh, those uh, uh, adulterous feeling and uh, uh, fornication and uh, selfishness and all the greed, everything it, it is it is there from the, our ancestors and uh, we cannot escape from it. Every non is you know righteous, you know the Bible said. So we are all sinners, and even Saint Paul, he is the greatest. You know, evangelist, this disciple of Jesus, he said he is a he is a sinner, and the, of of which he is a chief. He said he is a chief. So that this uh, uh, Romans, you know, his uh, his uh, uh, lamentation about the uh, sins uh, in his in his members, his body, it's uh, he. He lamented, you know. So the, the level of the lamentation, it is, it is hard to grasp that man like him, you know, man like him, how he could repent that much. He said, the wretched man that I am, you know, that is that the great, you know, disciple of Jesus, Saint Paul. He repented and to the level that that he he really really pre, you know cried out and lamented. That's that's the level of the you know a kind of repentance we need. We we cannot uh, just repent. Sorry, you know I I did something wrong. wrong. I'm sorry that I, I thought about this kind of uh, feeling about uh, this woman or you know I'm sorry that uh, I I I made a mistake and I, I ate too much. <laughs> Uh, we cannot make that kind of, it's not the repentance. You know, repentance is really the level that St. Paul show, shown us that crying out, crying out to God and uh, really uh, uh, when, when we reach that level of the repentance, we, we, we can, we can, you know, receive the Christ. So that is the, uh, you know, one of the things uh, we often uh, not talk about, that is a, you know, even though that we, we praise God and praise Jesus and, uh, uh, you know, we are grateful for the, you know, great news, you know, for the kingdom of heaven, but the most important step to, for the kingdom of heaven is the repentance. But to what level of the repentance? What, how we should repent? Uh, this is one of the things that I, I really thought about. The, the, there are so many, uh, you know, sad situation in the Bible, like a Cain killed the Abel. And that, that, is, that is terrible, terrible, you know, terrible things happened in the Adam's first family of, of God. But how, how, how we relate to that? How we relate to that Cain killed Abel? Actually, when, if, we, if we think that actually that was, he, that was me, I killed the Abel. Actually, the, the blood of the Cain is within me. Actually, we have that kind of anger, you know, resentment, and uh, uh, that me. You know, if, if we start looking at all the things that happened uh, in the Bible, uh, the disbelief, you know, and uh, 
uh, casting the stone and uh, uh, all these uh, persecution and uh, the Roman Empire, you know, Roman soldier uh, killed the, uh, you know, pierced the Jesus heart. That kind of thing, who did that? Actually, it, it's me. If you kind of really looking at that is me because the blood of those, you know, uh, the evil of satanic blood is within me. Like Saint Paul's, come, he came to that conclusion. That's why he was repenting that much. We know that he was the one that persecuted Christians. And uh, he is the one that tortured you know, Jesus' disciples. And so, so that is a level of the, of the you know, kind of a, uh, feeling, understanding of the, that, those, those, those depths of our sins, the sin that we, we, we are carrying from the past, from the ancestors, then we can really de repent. But uh, anyway, that is my, my reflection. And thank you. Uh, Reverend Gabriel, uh, thank you for First coming. Time. And uh, if you can give us some of some your uh, reflection on this topic. Praise God. Praise God. What I see in the in the in the in the open is that number one, repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is turning away from your old ways. Amen. Yes. Um, I'm moving to the new way. Moving to the new way. And then repentance takes place at the altar of humility. If one is not humble, you cannot, you cannot undergo repentance. He will always be justifying himself of everything he does. Mm -hmm. But we go to repentance without justifying ourselves. If there's anything that's killing the Christian today is self-justification. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Self-justification. I I know it all. You know what I'm doing is the right thing. Even though he's doing the wrong thing, he says he's doing the right thing. And if you go and check most of the churches today, hardly they don't preach repentance. Mm. You don't preach repentance. Mm. See, that is why you discover that the, 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 the church is going down. People have been discouraged. Somebody was telling me this morning that in their church, the, the choir master is befriending the pastor's wife. The pastor is befriending another, like that, like that, like that. Mm. Somewhere, you know, Brooklyn, in somewhere in Brooklyn. And then the church has gone down. To the extent that most of the churches now, if we go there, they are putting for sale. Because why? Within the period, people have not really humbled themselves. Leaders have not humbled themselves. So therefore, the disciples too have not humbled themselves to come to the place of repentance. You know, Paul, Paul, Paul humbled himself. What Paul was telling us is that, look, before then, I was a sinner. So don't think I'm an angel that fell from heaven. I was, Hebrew of, I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was among them who persecuted the church. Mm -hmm. But after repentance, I'm now a new person. And that's what uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 tells us. If a man be in Christ, is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he said there is no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Paul humbled himself. No wonder when he got to the Galatian church, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he said, not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. So if Christ, if we repentance happens at the place of humbleness, if I do what is wrong, I should know I have done what is wrong. Then the next thing to do what to ask forgiveness, to apologize. 
There's no need arguing. There's no need arguing. Look at what the governor of uh, New York is saying now concerning what they're accusing him for. Yeah. He came out and said, look, I'm sorry if I've offended anybody. Please, I'm sorry. It's not repentance. Eh? It's not no. repentance. Yeah, what, what happened was that uh, that is part of repentance too, because repentance is a category. That's part of repentance too. He, he, we don't, me and you don't know if actually he committed the sin. Mm, that's true. Me and you don't know if he actually committed the sin, but what we're saying now, we're talking about repentance. So for him at that level, for him at that level to descend and say, look, I am sorry I, if I've done anything that offended anybody, I did not mean it that way. It has not gone to that level. You understand what I'm saying, sir? So if he can come down as a governor back in Africa, nobody will come down and say, I'm sorry. Oh. No governor. So for him, he's an, he's, 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 he's an exemplary leader. No governor in Africa, in Nigeria, will come down and say, look, what I've done, I'm sorry. Hmm. He would rather justify himself. Ordinary, ordinary, a county, county chairman will not even come down and say, I am sorry, back in Nigeria or in Africa. So, but what we are saying here is humility. Humility. So we, we that is, that is, and the humility is the hallmark of Christianity. And that's what Christ showed us too in baptism with uh, John the Baptist at the river Jordan. Humility. In Mark chapter 3. Now, for him to, like what mommy told us, for him to have his ministry well established, he has to go into fasting. Mm. And that's why it's called in Luke chapter 4, when he said, Jesus Christ, after 40 days, 40 nights, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. Amen. And then, the question I say, how was he able to overcome temptation? Mm -hmm. We did not answer that question. How did, why, how did Jesus Christ overcome temptation. Number one, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was with him. Number two, he was able to overcome with the power of it is written. Power of it is written. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. It is written, yeah. Yes. Power of the word. God bless you. Power of the word. And that is lacking today. The word. Yes. The word. Many believers don't go, don't have Bible. How do they go to the, the, the whole Bible? Going to church, they don't go to church with Bible. Mm. You get to their homes, hardly will you see a quality Bible there. And yet they are Christians. They go to church, they are leaders. So that's why I discovered that husband will offend the wife. You find it very difficult to say, I'm sorry. Wife will say, wife will offend you. Husband, you find it difficult to say, I'm sorry. Out of an husband and wife, and then they were in America here. The woman said, Oh, yeah, get out of my car, get out of my car, get out. I don't want to see you here. You ask. And the man was begging her, Okay, sorry, I'm sorry. You see, and they have children together. He said, Get out here, I don't want to see you again. And the man came down. The man wanted to pass the back of the car to cross the road. He reversed the car. He wants to hit the guy from the back again. The guy narrowly escaped. Now you can imagine if they were brought up in the way of the Lord. If two of them were brought up in the way of the Lord. If you go to their parents now, they will say they are Christians. Where's your Bible? No Bible. No Bible. Power of it is written. Power. That's why it's called that. Go and check that Bible. Go and check your Bible. Luke chapter 4. It is written. It is written. You'll be hearing Jesus Christ will say, it is written. Yeah. Amen. And Satan did not understand the word it is written. Satan did not understand the word it is written. So when tem temptation will come as a Christian, temptation will come to us. We cannot, we cannot run away from temptation. 
but we can always overcome temptation with the power of it is written because that power of his reading will bring us to consciousness yeah. that it is temptation then will not give you way of escape according to second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. God has provided a way of escape for us at every point of temptation. It's in the Bible. And it can, that can only happen when you have the word in you. You escape. So the church, our churches has a lot to do. Churches has a lot to do. It's not a matter of tie to. Tie to is what is killing the church today. Tie to. Tie to. We must put that tie to behind us and then be able to do the rightful. If the if if the if if the ministers are so strong, America will be strong. If leaders are preaching the right thing, programs are being held and they are preaching the right word, the right word. And they make utter call. You see people come out, they will receive Jesus Christ as a personal and savior. Before you know it, America will be will be all, all, all around for God. God will help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Lord. you very much. Reverend Reginald, uh, sorry that uh, uh, you cannot speak today. Mm. I hope uh, next uh, next time that uh, uh, you can unmute yourself but uh, unfortunately that noise level is too high today so uh, uh, this will conclude our uh, our study and the forum and uh, so this uh, coming Sunday uh, we will have uh, our restoration uh, 4 p.m and uh, we have a uh, a new theme for this year, for this month, uh, restitution. And so uh, what we are talking about is somehow the very close to that, this theme, but we will we'll dig in more deep, deeper, deeper about this restitution. And uh, so uh, I hope everybody will join, join us. And the first Sunday, uh, we'll have a uh, ACLC uh, New York uh, District Coordinator, uh, Reverend Edna, uh, will give us a, a speech, uh, speak to us. And uh, so uh, he's going to minister the word. So please join us on uh, this coming Sunday. And then the Thursday, again, we're going to meet again, and then we're going to uh, go over the next chapter of the course, life course of the Jesus Christ. The, one of the most important area that we need to really understand the uh, life course of Jesus. So uh, please join us on next uh, Thursday, uh, 6 p.m. And uh, finally, I'd like to ask, uh, do you want to say a prayer? Mm. Uh, Julia will uh, give a final uh, closing prayer. Okay. Most, <clears throat> most beloved Heavenly Father, we come before you now to offer this uh, hour of <clears throat> restoration where we studied about the life of your son, Jesus, your most precious son who came to this earth 2,000 years ago and uh, by his love and by his suffering on the cross and his resurrection on the third day uh, was able to give us the salvation that we had been longing for uh, since the time of Adam and Eve's fall and also that you have been longing for to see your children freed from the sin and the suffering that um, that sin brought the death that was brought to us and that we were cursed with uh, through the fall. Father, we're so grateful to um, your son, Jesus. There's just no way we can really uh, show our gratitude or say how grateful we are. If we give our whole life, it would not be enough. But um, 
we are thankful and we just want to encourage you heavenly father because we are striving to do your will at this time at this precious time in history that we have that we are alive this is our time this is our time to do something for you this is our time to offer something of ourselves and of our work of our heart of our lives and i really pray that this offering that we make to you can be pleasing in your sight and can uh, uplift you as you uplift us father i pray that we can glorify you that we can glorify your name that we can glorify you to the all corners of the earth north south east and west and heavenly father that all men may come to know that you are their god that you are their father and that we are your children i pray all these things in the name of your son our lord christ amen 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 thank you very much praise the lord